it's time to look at the CPU. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> the CPU. We haven't talked about it yet other than it's got a whole bunch of stuff in it. Okay. So what's in the CPU? Well, let's take a look at, first of all, you know you're going to have to have a bunch of registers. So let's start with the data path. Okay. What we're going to have is we're going to have a whole set of registers. These registers are implemented as registers. Okay. They are nothing more than an individual process. And it's got, you know, clock and reset, but it's got other control signals that are synchronous and they're either enables, or loads, increments, depending on the register. Okay? So I want to think about this, this register by register and then necessitate the strategy we use for our signal routing. In the instruction register, it is going to be 8 bits. And what comes into the instruction register? Yeah, we're going to eventually get the opcode and put it in there. But the opcode comes from memory. Agreed? Okay. So when it comes in from memory, we will have it come along as an 8-bit value into the instruction register. And then we need the CP or the finite state machine, the control unit, to tell it when to grab that information. So we are actually going to have a load which will tell the instruction register when to grab the information. Okay? So if I came along here, I would have this load. Okay? And that's like an enable. So you pulse it high on the next clock edge, it grabs the information, pops it in there. Okay? Now, where does the instruction register output go? Does that opcode go to memory? It's actually only used by the control unit. It's used by the finite state machine. And so it actually doesn't go anywhere outside of the CPU. It actually just goes back into the, the control unit. Okay? Let's look at the next register, and that'll, that'll motivate what we choose to do with our signal routing. The next one is going to be memory address register. It's nothing more than a register. It's just a process, sensitive to clock and reset. What's it going to hold? It's going to hold the address, which is literally going out to the memory system. Okay? It's actually driving to the memory system. So that means its output goes out to the address. That's what its output is. Where does it get that address? It gets it from two locations. Sometimes, probably most times, it gets it from the program counter. Okay? But other times, it gets it from an operand. Okay? But those come from memory. So here is the pickle, the pickle dickle. We got memory producing information that we need to put into more than one register. The way that you have to do that, okay, the memory bus coming out is only 8 bits wide. So it's not like you, what you're going to do is you're going to allow multiple registers to use it as an input. Okay? So we are going to introduce this whole notion of a bus. Okay? I have gone ahead and named the bus for you. Okay? I called it bus 2. Okay? You're like, why bus 2? What did we do? Where's bus 1? Well, bus 1's over there. We'll worry about that here in a second. Okay? Here's the way that bus 2 is going to work. It is going to provide information to the inputs of registers. So far, we've got the instruction register, we've got the memory address register. They're both going to tie in to bus 2. Okay? The way that we tell these registers when to grab that information off of bus 2 is with synchronous control lines. Who knows when these things should load? The control lines, such as IR load, will come from the finite state machine. These are outputs of the finite state machine that you create. Guess what? MAR load, memory address register load, also comes from the control state machine. In this way, your finite state machine in one state might tell instruction register, go ahead and load whatever's on bus 2. In another state, it might tell the memory address register, go ahead and load what's on bus 2. The finite state machine knows what is on bus 2. 
because it is in control of what is put on it. Okay, it is the brains. It is controlling all the signal data movement. Now, let's look at the next register because this one's actually a little bit more complicated. It's our buddy. Okay, they're all our buddies, but this, you know, not all friends are created equal. Would you agree with that? This, this, we really like this one. This is the program counter. Okay, remember what the program counter does. It holds the address in program memory of where we're executing code. Most of the time, you're going to increment it. Okay, it's just going to be click, 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 click. It's just moving sequentially through memory. In the situation of a branch, we need to put a new address into it. So it has two pieces of functionality. One, it needs to be able to be incremented just like a normal counter. It also sometimes needs to just load a value. Okay? So we are going to have two synchronous control signals that drive the program counter. They are going to be called PC load and PC ink. Okay? Guess what PC load does. It tells the program counter to load. PC load letter. Okay? Now, you're like, what the hell is it going to load? Well, guess what? We already set up a nice little bus system for ourselves. It is going to load in whatever is on bus 2. Okay? So bus 2 right here, not that I need to make it a different color because it's already blue, but it's going to be able to load whatever is on bus 2. Okay? What do you think, if you were just to guess, okay? I'm going to challenge you. What do you think PC Inc. is going to do? <laughs> Increment it? Yes. You're going to stop it? <laughs> it is going to increment the program counter. OK. Here is something that is quite interesting, though. We have a new thing to do with the output of this register. Okay. You know what we did before? Instruction register, its output didn't go anywhere other than back to the control unit state machine. So we just wired it straight on back and used it as an input to the state machine. The state machine would look at it, decide what path to go down. MAR was interesting, okay, because all its output did is it just, you just wired it to the port, the address port. The program counter is kind of a weird one because its output needs to go somewhere sometimes. Where does the output of the program counter go? Whenever we fetch, we take the address of where we're executing code and we put it out on the address. But the memory address register is who holds the address. This value, program counter, has, has to actually come out, somehow route itself back into bus 2 and then be loaded by the instruction register. So we have like a loop that we need to do. Now that's not magic, okay? We do this all the time. The output of a register, it goes to the input of another register. But we need a way to route this stuff around, okay? Okay, before we look at how we're going to do the signal routing, I want to tell you about two other friends of mine, not, not quite as close as the program counter, just more like acquaintances, okay? Are user-defined registers A and B, okay? When we load from memory, information from memory comes into the CPU, and we need to load it in there, okay? We will put that information from memory on the bus 2, just like we've done before. So sometimes the information coming on a bus 2 is just general purpose. It might be a constant. It might be data from memory. Sometimes it might be an address that goes into MAR. Sometimes it might be the, uh, an opcode that goes in the instruction register. But both of these puppies okay, are going to get their information from bus 2. They will each also have a load signal. So they're each going to have a, lo a load signal. I named it for you. Okay, Bear with me. A load. Does anybody know what that's going to mean? <laughs> Increment the program counter? No! Okay. It means load A. All right. Guess what? B needs one too. All right. This is interesting. Okay. 
because now we have a situation where the program counter needs to get back onto bus two. You know what else is gonna happen? What if I do A plus B and store it back in A? I'm gonna take A and B, their outputs, go do something, and then I'm gonna need to take the result and put it back into A. We have situations here where A and B are also gonna need to go back onto bus two. So we have weirdness now. But it's so simple to handle with the thing called a multiplexer, okay? Everything that we do in our signal routing is one way, okay? It's not bidirectional. So here's the need. We have a need to put program counter A or B and also the memory system output onto bus two. So here's the way we're gonna handle it. We are gonna handle it using another bus called bus one and another multiplexer and two multiplexers, okay? So here now becomes the entire CPU. Now let's think about this. When you have bus two, a lot of times you're gonna bring information into bus two from memory. So we're gonna bring the port from memory on the bus two sometimes. We are gonna bring it into a multiplexer. The CPU will control the multiplexer. Well, not CPU, the control unit, okay? The finite state machine. The finite state machine knows when whatever's on from memory, whatever's coming out of the memory, because it is the brains. It is orchestrating all of this. It's never just, I wonder what's out there. The finance state machine knows because it's doing it, okay? So sometimes this, the control unit state machine will tell this multiplexer to put from memory onto the bus, okay? Other times, for example, during a fetch, we will need to bring program counter and get it onto bus two, okay? But since we also might need A, and we might also need B, we introduce a second multiplexer that takes these puppies and chooses which one of them will then go to bus two. So we have a situation where we have bus one now, which can take on either program counter A or B, and it is one of the lines that could potentially go to bus two. So it has to be one of the choices for the multiplexer over here, okay? Now, here is what's fascinating. Bus one, what we are gonna do with it is we are going to drive it out to the memory system, okay? And you go, wait a minute, wait a minute. What the hell's going on here? You got program counter, you said it never goes to the memory system. It doesn't go to the memory system. You would never do that. But A and B do, right? What is the situation, what's an instruction where you might take the value of A or B and put it out into the memory system? A store. So absolutely, this is the mechanism that we get the information from a register out to the memory system. The last part of this is the ALU. How are we gonna do an instruction like A plus B and stick it into A? First of all, you need a way to get both A and B into the ALU. And you say, why wouldn't I just hard code A and B? It turns out that it would be easier to be able to put B as one of its hard coded inputs and then take bus one as its other input. That allows us to do weird stuffs, okay? It allows us to do more combinational logic operations than if you hard-coded A and B on there. You could actually, in this situation, you could add B to itself, okay? If you said, I wanna do B plus B and stick it in B, okay? So there's a lot of weird operations that you could do. So this is a common technique. Okay, so this is how the ALU works. Now, for your simulations, you don't have to have the ALU working, okay? All you're gonna do is load stores and branch always. So at this moment in time, we have the whole CPU, okay? Almost except for the ALU. And that's stuff that you do a little bit later. Let me just ask you some questions. Do you have any idea 
how you would code up, let's just say this guy right here, bus one select. This is this multiplexer. Any ideas? Process. Absolutely. Let's do it as a process. Is it combinational or sequential logic? It's actually combinational logic. Let us take a look at this snippet. Okay. Here is some VHDL somebody wrote. Okay. And I say process bus one select. What the hell is that? That's the control line coming in from the control unit save machine. PC A and B. All the inputs that go into this thing are listed in the sensitivity list. That means combinational logic. When you look at bus one select, which is the select line, and you say when it's zero zero, bus one gets program counter. Does that make sense? When bus one, when the control or when the select line is zero one, bus one gets A. When it's one zero, bus one gets B. When others just drive zero to it. Okay, not that hard, is it? What's cool is we started way at the top and we broke it down into subcomponents, subcomponents, subsystems, subsystems, subsystems. We get everything down into this the smallest unit before we code it. Okay, that way it's easy to say, show me the functionality for that mux. And I can look at this and I can say, nice job. All right, you ready? You ready for another mux? Check this out. You're checking it, you're trying, you're trying. There it is. Bus two select, ALU select, bus one, and from memory. You go, what the hell is ALU select? Well, it's, I mispronounced result, okay? So ALU result means this is one of the things that comes over to that. Why would we want to do that? Because if you added A plus B, the sum needs to go into A. And that needs to get back onto bus two. So we have to have the output of the ALU as one of the inputs into the bus, okay? Look at the code for it. I look at bus two select, and I say, if it's zero, zero, assign bus two ALU result. If it's zero, one, bus two gets bus one. If it's one, zero, bus two gets from memory. Otherwise, just assign it to zero. Very simple. We broke it down into a very simple, well-defined unit. How's that feel? Yeah, feels good, doesn't it? Feels good. Good. Real good. How about a register? You guys want to do a register? It's been a while since we've done one of these. How about instruction register? You think you can handle that? I say to you, instruction register, is it, what's in the sensitivity list? Clock and reset. Should you list some other inputs? Don't do it, man. Clock and reset always, because it's a set of flip-flops. But check out this. If reset to zero, reset it to zero. It's a set of flip-flops. You've got to have a reset situation. Otherwise, first of all, what's the output? Let's we'll make up a register called IR. We've got to make a signal called IR. Okay? IR doesn't exist. It's an internal thing. Okay? You are then going to say, otherwise, if I get a clock edge, I then look and say, is IR load asserted? If it is, IR gets bus two, bam. Otherwise, hold the information. That little fella right there is a perfect register. You've done it a bunch of times now, okay? And it's the reason we did it a bunch of times is because this is how you implement it. Any questions on that? Now, I'm not telling you how to live your life by any means. But copying and pasting could be a good friend of yours. Memory address register. Clock and reset in the sensitivity list. If you get a rising edge of a clock, go ahead and make this signal you've created mar a zero. Otherwise, if you get a clock edge, did I say reset or clock? If you get a reset, make it zero. If you get a clock edge, check to see if you have a load asserted and then update it with bus two. How's that feel? All right, hold on. We're going to do the program counter. The program counter has more functionality. It needs to both increment and load. What are we going to do? Holy cow, do we have the ability to do this? 
sensitivity list clock and reset. If it's got a reset, make it zero. You know what's freaking cool about that? I just set the starting address of where to go get the first opcode in memory. That right there was more than just resetting it. That was powerful. That was where I'm going to execute code upon boot up. That's a big deal. Okay. All right. Now, the first thing you're going to see is you have a thing called PC underscore unsigned. Why am I now creating a new internal variable of type unsigned? It's a bunch of stuffs, stuff slots. It's because we're going to increment the program counter, so we're going to use the plus sign, and we're going to use a new package for that. We're going to use numeric standard, so we can only use it on unsigned, so you got to do your type casting stuff. So what you're going to see here is I have this internal variable called PC unsigned. If I get a clock edge, I say, if PC load is equal to 1, update it with bus 2 but you got to cast it. Not a big deal. If you get PC ink, do PC unsigned equals PC unsigned plus one. So there you did it. The last step of that then is outside of the process, go ahead and cast that puppy back to standard logic. Nothing magic. What about this guy? A and B, think you can handle that? It's nothing. Copy, paste, bada bing, all you do. Clock reset. If reset, A gets zero. Otherwise, look at the clock. If you get a load, A gets bus 2. Repeat for B. All right, here we go. That is the CPU. Now you're like, what about the ALU? Let me tell you something. You get the machine working first with the loads, stores, and branch always, and then the ALU will be pretty simple. 